Our next star is uh, Dr. Alan Hanash, who is an assistant member also, and uh, he works in bone marrow transplantation and in the laboratory works on immu the immunology of the hematopoietic system and immune-mediated me mechanisms of tissue damage. Alan. Thank you, Dr. Kantoff, for the introduction, uh, and Samantha for the invitation, and to all of you for coming. Um, it's really an honor to be here and share a little bit of what we do with you. Um, so Samantha asked me to speak a little bit about you know, how I got to be here as a junior faculty member uh, on the bone marrow transplant service, uh, studying immunology of bone marrow transplantation. And so I thought, naturally, Star Wars. Um, because as a child of the 70s, uh, this is what I grew up on. The, the movies, the toys, this was you know, an integral part of my young development. And what was interesting was that when, you know, later on when I was in school, I really became fascinated by immunology. And one of the things that was so fascinating about it to me is that your immune system is, is really quite complicated, and there are many different components of the immune system, many different types of cells that each play a different role, each contribute to the immune response in a different way. You have the, the T cells and NK cells, which are able to kill other cells. You have the B cells that make antibodies, excuse me, that make antibodies. You have the neutrophils that release enzymes that can be toxic to, to bacteria, and you have macrophages that gobble up invaders. So you have all these different, and there are many others that, you know, you know I can't fill them all up on the screen. They're, they're all contributing to the immune response. And, and it was almost in my mind like Star Wars. We have so many different characters and players involved in, in, in this battle. And when you, you put this in the context of a bone marrow transplant, it becomes even much more fascinating. Because in a bone marrow transplant, we're giving patients with cancer high doses of chemotherapy, sometimes with radiation. And then after that, you give them new cells. Sometimes they're their own cells. Sometimes they're donor cells. But when you have this process, you have not just an immune system, but you have two immune systems. You've got the donor's immune system, the recipient's immune system. And so all of this is going on in twofold, battling it out. And of course, the reason why we're doing this is to try and cure cancer. So we're actually using the immune system um, and cellular therapies as a way to cure cancers that otherwise could not be cured with chemotherapy alone. So this was, you know, amazing to me. And when I started to have my clinical training and I saw it actually performed in the hospital, not just as a, as a researcher and a scientist during graduate school, you know, I was hooked. And, and so, of course, this isn't just uh, science fiction. It's not just fantasy. We actually do this and it's actually bone marrow transplantation is an amazing field and a continuously growing field. And for, for the last 30 years, it's been growing on an annual basis. This is uh, transplants performed cumulatively in the United States, but worldwide, uh, you, you see the same thing. So the use of transplantation and the indications for transplantation are really increasing. And as we have greater donor availab availability and we get more creative with our transplants, and it actually becomes safer, uh, it continues to grow. And of course, here we have the two biggest classes of transplantation, autologous, which means a patient gets chemotherapy and then their own cells back, and allogeneic, where the patient will get chemotherapy and then receive cells from a donor. And of course, it's the combination of the chemo plus the new cells that are able to clear out the cancer cells. And so, you know, this is an amazing, amazing therapy we can offer to people, but of course, it doesn't always work, right? And, and when it fails, there are a few different patterns of how it fails. So if you have an allogeneic transplant, a donor transplant, um, the different ways in which it fails, most frequently, in fact, the disease can come back. Um, in addition, uh, through this intensive chemotherapy, the immune system is weakened and people are at risk for, for life-threatening infections. And there's another process that happens that we call GVHD, or graft-versus-host disease. And this occurs when the cells from the new immune system, the donor cells, actually attack the recipient. Um, instead of attacking the cancer, or perhaps in addition to attacking the cancer, they're attacking the patient. So that's why we call it graft versus host disease. And 
you know, although we can, can subdivide all these complications into these different components, in fact, almost about three quarters of all these complications are actually related to graft versus host disease. And that's because when patients develop this immune response, either to treat it or prevent it, we have to weaken the immune system. And when we weaken the immune system, we increase the risk of infections and we increase the risk of, of relapse of the cancer. So understanding specifically how the immune system works and the good things that the immune system is doing in clearing out the cancer versus causing tissue damage and, and, and causing GVHD is really critical. Um, and so one of the most important targets of graft-versus-host disease is actually the GI tract. Uh, Graft-versus-host disease in the intestines is very common uh, relatively to other types, and it's a little bit harder to treat. Um, and as I mentioned before, the treatments themselves uh, are problematic because it, they weaken the immune system. So we thought that to really understand the disease and how we can develop new ways to treat it and prevent it, we have to understand the tissues a little bit better and understand how our immune system interacts with our tissues. So this is actually an image, a 3D image of the intestines. This is the inner lining of your intestines. This, was, this image, this 3D image was uh, performed by a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. And so what you have here in gray, this is actually the lining. We call this epithelium. And this is the lining of the inside of your intestines. And so this is made up of many gray cells, these gray cells, many different cells. These are responsible for absorbing nutrients. So this is the surface of the inside of the intestines. And as you see down here, these pits, we actually call them crypts. These crypts are where the stem cells are located within the intestines. So the stem cells sit down here at the, at the base of the crypt, and as they divide, they become progenitor cells, which are <coughs> maturing. And as they continue to divide, they end up out here on the surface and make the mature lining. So the stem cells sit at the bottom down here, and your mature cells are out here. Here I'm showing you a high-powered uh, microscopic picture of the bottom of these crypts here. And so these very slender cells, these are actually the stem cells. And as they divide, you know, they, they move up here and become the mature adult cells. These other cells that are sort of in contact with the slender cells, these are called panis cells or niche cells. And these actually form the home, the environment where the stem cells live. So these granules here include growth factors that help support the stem cells, keep them alive, keep them happy so they can mature and become our internal lining. And in fact, this is a continuously uh, happening process. Every three to five days, your entire lining of your intestines is brand new, coming down here from the stem cells and the progenitors that are inside the crypt. So you have constant turnover to maintain your intestines. And, and so this is an experiment I performed while I was a trainee here. Um, I, I mentioned that I studied transplant immunology as a graduate student. And then I got my medical training at the University of Chicago. The reason I came to Memorial Sloan Kettering was for hematology oncology training. And I did that to be a part of the fellowship here because, in my opinion, it's actually the best cancer center in the country. And there's actually, there's no competition really. It's, it's cut and dry. And, and so I was definitely coming here. And, and not just for cancer overall, but specifically for bone marrow transplantation, it, it's an amazing center. And, you know, it, it's not just coming from me. When I take care of patients on the transplant ward, they tell me how they visited this center, they visited that center, and they've never been treated or cared for the same way that they have here. So it's, it's actually, you know, to hear it from them, it's quite meaningful. And so I came here as a trainee to, to learn more about clinical transplantation and perform research on it. And so I worked with Marcel Vandenbrink, who is one of our senior bone marrow transplanters here. Uh, I worked in his laboratory and with Marcel and another laboratory here that was studying intestinal stem cells, we performed this experiment. And the experimental question we were asking was, what happens to those intestinal stem cells during graft versus host disease? So we performed a bone marrow transplant in mice. We used very special mice where the stem cells that I told you about are blue. So blue equals stem cells. I told you those stem cells sit at the base of those crypts. And so here, this is mouse small intestine. So lining, lining the, the base here, all of these crypts here, 
lining the base of those crypts, you have blue cells, those are the stem cells. So this is the normal mouse, normal mouse small intestine. If we give the mouse a T cell depleted bone marrow transplant, this is a transplant where we remove the T cells from the donor graft. It's actually a type of transplant where clinically here at MSKCC, we have tremendous expertise. We're actually really the world leaders in this type of transplant. So if you perform this type of transplant, no T cells, no graft versus host disease, you can see that the mice keep their stem cells. You have lots of blue cells in the crypts. The tissue looks pretty nice. These you know, villi where you have absorption going on, they look healthy, and you have lots of stem cells. But if the mice get T cells and they develop graft versus host disease, it's pretty obvious this is really different. The tissue looks like a mess, and you have a significant loss of the blue cells. You have a loss of the stem cells. So we saw here from this experiment that in graft versus host disease, at least in mice experimentally, you lose the stem cells that are necessary for maintaining the intestines. And we think this probably has something to do with why patients develop graft versus host disease in the GI tract. So thanks to this experiment and, and the publications that we were able to, to, uh, to gain from this, I was able to get a couple of grants, uh, one from the government, one from the National Marrow Donor Program. And these two grants really helped me to establish my laboratory. And, and once I got those grants, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering said, you know what, you know, this is a guy who maybe can do it. You know, it's an actually, there's still a lot of competition, but maybe he can do it, so let's help him. And so then the center gave me a lot of their own internal funding to help start my lab. And I actually had the opportunity to do that at a, at a few different centers, but one of the reasons I, I took them up on the offer here is because it's really an amazing place, both for cancer care overall, but also for clinical transplantation and the laboratory research. And, you know, as I mentioned when I introduced this slide, it was a collaborative experiment. It wasn't just the laboratory I was working in, but it was along with another laboratory here at MSKCC. And so to have that clinical connection and the scientific collaborations here, um, you know, it was really a no-brainer for me to set up my, my lab here. And so, so what my lab has been set up to do is really to study how the immune system interacts with our tissues and how our immune system interacts with the stem cells inside of our tissues. And so one of the ways we thought we could try to do this is by not just using, you know, not just using the mice with those fancy cells, but actually to grow the tissue in a dish. And so this is one of those crypts that I showed you before. It's pretty remarkable when you remove it. Uh, you can do this from mice, you can also do it from people. It retains that, that shape of those pits, of those crypts. We grow it in culture, after a day it's become a sphere. And after a week, we've grown new crypts that have budded off from the original one. So these are new crypts and a crypt growing off of the crypt. So you have new stem cell compartments that are regenerating in the dish as we grow them. And so in my lab, we've used this as a model system to understand how the immune system is interacting with these tissues. And one of the things that we found is that a molecule from the immune system that's called interleukin-22, in fact, it's very useful for helping the stem cells to grow and helping the tissue to grow. And what's kind of fascinating about it is that normally in a healthy tissue, healthy, healthy mouse, healthy person, you don't really need this molecule to encourage growth. You have the tissue, you have the stem cells, they've got their niche cells, it grows just fine. But when the tissue is damaged, the immune system gets turned on. And it's not just getting turned on to fight infection, but it's getting turned on to regulate your stem cells and help the tissue regenerate. And so here in this experiment, what I'm showing you is that the, the, the tissue, the intestinal tissue that we grow from the crypts in the dish, if we include interleukin-22 in these cultures, it's pretty clear that they grow much larger. The, the growth is really enhanced dramatically. And this is, this is mouse small intestine, but it's actually true for human tissue as well. If we include interleukin-22, the growth is really enhanced. And so this growth is important not just in a dish, but in fact, if we give mice a bone marrow transplant and we treat the mice with IL-22, we can see that the tissue is more protected. You see this is a little bit of a mess like the one I showed you before. And here you have these very nice villi that are intact and can perform their epithelial function. And if you look close up at the crypts, you have sort of the blue is quite faint. And here it's much more prominent. So we treat the mice with this molecule that increases growth in the dish. 
and in the mice themselves, we protect the tissue, we protect the intestine, and even though the T cells are there, by stimulating the stem cells and stimulating the tissue, we can protect the tissue and increase their growth. And it not just helps with the histology, with the picture, but in fact, the mice live longer too. So this is mice that have undergone a bone marrow transplant. This is not the way we would do it clinically. They have no immunosuppression. The general protections that we give our patients, these mice don't have because it's an experiment and we need to study the disease process. But in fact, without even the immunosuppression, if we give them this tissue cytokine, we can increase the, the, the survival of these mice. And so in fact, it's not just something we published, but we're actually starting a clinical trial based on this for our own patients with graft versus disease. And it's actually supposed to start this week. Um, so we're, we're really excited about this opportunity to take something from a very fundamental concept in how the immune system works to in fact apply it to our patients and, and try to help them uh, get through this process better, cure their disease with transplantation and immunotherapy, and, and use tissue targeted immunotherapy to make the process better. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of people to thank for, uh, for, for the work that I just showed you. Some of them are the people who perform the work. Some of them are collaborators internally and at other institutions who, who worked with us. Um, but as Dr. Kantoff mentioned, the, the groups who funded the work are, are really critical partners as well because we wouldn't be able to do it w without that support. And our, our support has come from both internal sources as well as as the grants we've had to fight for. And you know, one point I'd like to highlight, highlight in regard to that is that Dr. Kantoff mentioned that competition for funding is, is quite intense, and that's true. But another thing that doesn't get uh, noticed quite as often is that if you treat a specific disease or a specific problem that's not as obvious to many people, and I suspect that some of the things I told you about tonight you may not have been aware of beforehand, it's even harder to get funding. So funding is not allotted to everything under the sun equally. Um, and, and without sources that are gonna fund unique types of research, it can be really hard to get it done. And one of the important grants that I had was specifically this Amy Streltzer grant from the National Marrow Donor Program. So having donors involved that recognize that there's a problem that needs to be supported, you know, is, is actually really critical for us to take care of, of all of our patients. So on that note, uh, thank you again for, for coming and 